for 1 p.m. So I think we can we can get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to this uh, roundtable titled "Who Governs the Eurozone: The Political Economy of Fiscal Rules." Um, this roundtable, as you know, is jointly organized by the New Economics Foundation as part of their Fiscal Matters Week of Debates on uh, Fiscal Issues and Fiscal Reform in the EU, together with the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Societies in Cologne as part of our long-running seminar series on Comparative Political Economy, Max CPE. Uh, my name is Arena Tassinari. I am a senior researcher here at the Max Planck Institute in Cologne, and I will be moderating today's uh, roundtable. So um, the aim of this event is uh, precisely to bring together uh, policymakers with academics and political economists to discuss perspectives on the future of Europe's fiscal rules. Um, and uh, joining me today, we have uh, five high profile guests that will provide us with uh, great insights and uh, um, hopefully some, some lively debate. Um, so before I introduce them briefly, I would like to inform you as the audience that uh, we are currently recording the uh, event. Um, so, uh, you know, bear this in mind and by staying in, in the, the, the virtual room, you're um, giving your consent to the, um, you know, be part of the recording. Um, so moving on to introducing our guests. Uh, so first of all, we have uh, Professor Valtraud Schelke. Uh, Valtraud is the Professor of Political Economy at the European Institute at the London School of Economics. And she is the author of a seminal book on the Eurozone crisis uh, titled The Political Economy of Monetary Solidarity, Understanding the Euro Experiment, which was published in 2017. Um, and we have Paul Thompson, who was until 2020 the director of uh, the European Department at the International Monetary Fund, uh, where he supervised the fund's bilateral surveillance work in 44 European countries. Uh, Paul is currently professor in practice, also at the LSE's European Institute. Um, and we have Victor Constancio uh, joining us today. Victor was uh, vice president of the European Central Bank from uh, um, June 2020 until May 2018. And previously, he served as governor of the Bank of Portugal between 2000 and 2010. Victor is currently professor at the University of Navarra and president of the Council of Isaac University of Lisbon. We're then joined by Lucio Baccaro. Uh, Professor Lucio Baccaro is the director of uh, the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Societies here in Cologne and one of the co-organizers of uh, Max CP, our seminar series in comparative political economy. And last but definitely not least, we have uh, Professor Benedicta Marzinotto. Benedicta is a lecturer in economic policy at the University of Udine, as well as a visiting professor at the College of Europe and an adjunct faculty at SAIS John Hopkins. Um, so before we get started, I'm just going to explain briefly the format of the event today. So we're going to have, first of all, opening remarks by each of uh, the speakers. Um, we will then have a moderated debate where I will be asking some follow up questions and uh, the speakers will have a chance to sort of interact directly with one another. And then we will open up the floor for Q&A from the audience. So if you would like to ask a question to any of our speakers directly or to all of the panelists, please feel free to um, write in the chat uh, the, the question directly and then I can read it out loud. Or you can write a queue and I will then call upon you, um, you know, in the Q&A, ask you to unmute and to ask your question directly, whatever format works best. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to, um, first of all, uh, Professor Schelkle. So, um, Valtraud, as I mentioned, obviously in your in your work, you have dealt already extensively with uh, the governance of, uh, of fiscal policy and the politics of monetary solidarity during Europe's last crisis. So, reflecting on the current conjuncture, um, you know, and from the research that you've been doing uh, on the on the on the current phase. Uh, um, to what extent would you say that Europe's fiscal policy response to the COVID-19 pandemic was different than the response to the Euro crisis and why? And how much would you say has COVID-19 affected the prospects for European risk sharing beyond the pandemic and the prospects for possible reform of the current fiscal rules? Valtra, do you have the floor? Valtra, you have to unmute yourself. I thought I had done this, sorry about that. Um, a really good set of questions. Thank you, Ariana. Um, 
I think the fiscal policy response to COVID-19 was an exercise in the politics of, of path breaking, especially by the Italian and the Spanish governments. Why? Well, the ESM and the Troika intervention were identified with a history of policy failure. That is to some extent not as straightforward as one thinks, because that firewall as the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism, the bailout fund is called, is actually has actually done its job in terms of a firewall. And nobody was more of a beneficiary of that than Italy. But the conditionality that came with it, this intrusive uh, you know, request for all kinds of reforms that were only loosely related to the problem of, uh, of over indebtedness that came when the financial markets basically turned the table on governments after they had bailed them out. And the recession had, had uh, brought some countries on their knees. Uh, that in these intrusive uh, conditions were seen as something that is really not acceptable among semi-sovereign states. And so they talked immediately about this crisis. This is a different crisis. This is a common experience. Uh, we, uh, we, we don't want to repeat this. And they were to some extent supported by the German government that saw kind of that this is not possible. For example, Scholz gave an interview that said, we will not do that kind of stupid thing again, uh, telling everybody what they have to do in terms of policy reforms. This time it's about supporting each other. And so it was a critical juncture in the sense of how Capoccia and Kellerman talk about this and they remind us that this can actually entail maintaining the status quo, but the critical juncture shows at least that there's an alternative path. And this is, I think, what the fiscal response to the pandemic has shown. And the beauty of this recovery fund that they created is, of course, that it allows democratically accountable governments to sit on the fence for a while longer regarding a more lasting fiscal, financial, uh, fiscal integration. And of course, the, has gone around the whole problem of, of euro bonds and joint liability for the bonds directly. Instead, we have the responsibility, the joint liability for the budget, which member states have. The main recipients, and they are the Southern European countries, but also some Eastern European uh, uh, countries, they must prove that they take the chance and invest these funds well. Um, if used as foreseen, the this RRF, the Recovery and Resilience Facility, can be made permanent. And, you know, with an accelerating climate change uh, crisis, there will be plenty of opportunities to deploy the funds in the future. But it is rightly conditional on that. Uh, you know, if we had a constant stream of stories about blatant abuse of these funds, that would do nothing for further fiscal integration. And perhaps I leave it at that for the moment, Diana. Great, thank you very much, Valtrot, for this uh, very interesting first insights. Um, so obviously, um, I mean, I'm going to go next to uh, uh, Vitor, uh, Vitor Constancio. So, um, Vitor, obviously, you know, the Europe's response was uh, regarded as exceptional, not only in matters of fiscal policy, but also in matters of monetary policy. And, uh, and so you were at the center of the ECB policy making for a long time. So um, what we wanted to ask you to kick off the debate was, um, you know, from your standpoint, what would you say has been, is the view of uh, central bankers uh, uh, regarding Europe's current fiscal rules and according to your uh, analysis, how should and could the fiscal rules be changed in order to accommodate the ECB's um, monetary policy in the current phase? Thank you very much. Uh, and also thank you to all the organizers uh, for inviting me. Um, uh, sorry, well, are you able to turn on your camera by any chance? Because we cannot see you at the moment. Otherwise, oh, no problem. Oh, OK, sorry. great. Now we can see you. I, I was thank not you. aware. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, very good. Uh, so. As I was saying, uh, thank you to uh, the organizers for uh, inviting me. Um, well, picking up on your question, uh, it has changed uh, over uh, the years since the beginning of the uh, monetary union. But for years now, the ECB has been asking for fiscal policy to help uh, as monetary policy was uh, 
diminishing uh, their, uh, its effectiveness uh, over time because uh, interest rates uh, have become too low to be a uh, effective instrument uh, uh, down the road. Um, the, uh, there is this effective lower bound uh, and the ECB already has negative policy rates and cannot go uh, lower. And interest rates have been decreasing for 35 years um, and that is uh, before there were financial crises or monetary policy, uh, large purchases of securities. So this new environment of uh, secular stagnation upends the uh, traditional assigned roles to fiscal uh, policy and monetary policy. Uh, in old times, uh, fiscal policy was supposed to deal only with the public debt, whereas monetary policy would either have responsibility for full macro stabilization uh, in the US with the Fed or just inflation control uh, for the ECB. What is new in the new environment is that fiscal policy must have a more active role in stabilizing in the short term uh, our uh, economies. And there is a lesson from the double deep recession uh, between 11 and 13 when all countries in the euro area uh, adopted restrictive uh, policy. And then there is the fear now that fiscal policy can become again too restrictive um, when there is at this moment the necessity to have uh, further growth in order to catch up the trend of growth that was prevailing before uh, COVID and also eliminating still the big economic slack that exists in the labor market. The unemployment rate is predicted to increase from 21 to 23 over what it was in 20. The larger uh, measure of unemployment, U6, is at 15%, and there are still almost 33 million uh, uh, employed people at the beginning of last year that are still not uh, employed. So uh, naturally, of course, fiscal policy will reduce now the expansionary stance that it had in 20 and 21. Uh, total fiscal impulse will be uh, reduced, uh, as well as the fiscal stance measured by the annual changes of the uh, cyclically adjusted primary balance. But if the previous fiscal rules are restored after the suspension that they have had uh, last year and this year, then fiscal policy will become more restrictive and a significant growth deceleration uh, in the future uh, may very well occur. Uh, and the problem is mostly about the debt criteria in the fiscal rules. The 60% threshold in the protocol uh, in the treaty and the formula to countries to converge to that number when they are above uh, with the imposition of reducing every year by 5% debt excess. That if restored will uh, uh, increase the restrictiveness of uh, uh, fiscal policy. And the rationale for the 60 is no longer valid, which was at the time that if in the worst case scenario, all countries would have a 3% deficit uh, or every year, then with expected nominal uh, uh, GDP growth of 5%, three in real terms to inflation, uh, this ratio would, can be proved that would make debt converging to 60%. But now potential growth in the Euro area is around 1.1, 1.2. And if we make the same calculation that then the debt ratio to which uh, now the Euro area would converge in that scenario would be 92% and not 60. So it is desirable now that a new target uh, will be adopted or that uh, 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 formula will be substituted by regular uh, debt sustainability analysis and that we will uh, go, as many have uh, now proposed, to an expenditure rule uh, fiscal uh, 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 framework uh, with some exclusion to some green investments that are crucial to crowd in the huge needed private investment for the greening of our economies. Well, in political econ econ economy terms and in terms of power, who will decide? Well, it's very simple. Uh, Germany will decide, as Germany has decided 
everything, absolutely everything regarding fiscal uh, policy rules in Europe since the creation of the Stability and Growth Pact. Nothing can happen or be adopted without, of course, the agreement uh, of Germany. And so uh, my view after the elections in Germany is somewhat pessimistic uh, uh, about the future in view of statements, including by Mr. Schultz, that said that uh, Germany will go back to the debt rake already in 23 uh, and all of that. Uh, and at most, perhaps being pessimistic, uh, I hope I am wrong, the only the convergent path formula of the every year reduction of 5% will be eliminated uh, or suspended uh, forever uh, or uh, some other change. That will be not enough and will create immediately huge pressure on the ECB not to decide in December as announced a true drastic reduction of bond, bond purchases in December. Uh, central bank has interest that fiscal uh, policy would continue to do its uh, role in this environment where interest rates are already so low that they cannot be reduced anymore. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Victor, for this really interesting as well as somewhat sobering remarks. <laughs> um, so moving on to Benedicta. So Benedicta, obviously, um, you know, you've also been studying, uh, you know, Eurozone governance and European economic policy for a long time. And uh, so I wanted to ask you to start off with um, to what extent do you see the European response as already, uh, you know, having to some extent taken steps towards change and to address some of the challenges that, for example, um, Vitter was just referring to, you know, for example, uh, in what ways would you say that the recovery fund next generation EU has fundamentally or, you know, partially started to change the political economy of the Eurozone and in your view, what else would need to be done to make Europe's recovery sustainable? Sure. First of all, thank you for the invitation. I have to say it's an honor to be part of this uh, very distinguished panel. Uh, let me start by acknowledging uh, what is to me the fundamental difference uh, from a political economy perspective between the COVID shock and the global financial crisis. Then uh, we had short-term convertibility risks, the risk of a breakup of the Eurozone, but long-term opportunities would Europe successfully overcome uh, financial stress. Now the situation is reversed because we have short-term opportunities in the form of the recovery fund you just mentioned, but long-term risks because the COVID-19 shock is leaving us with debt sustainability issues and more so in some countries than in others, which is complicating the political economy of the Eurozone. But it is also leaving us with an indebted EU budget. So what the recovery fund does is in fact shifting risks into a distant future, uh, because whilst the commission is already borrowing on capital markets under EU budget guarantee, we should not forget there's no agreement as yet on how this new supranational debt is going to be financed, whether by means of the usual national contributions, and then it may become a solidarity instrument, or through the introduction of new resources. And in any case, repayments are made until 2058. So it's a very long-term horizon. So to me, the recovery fund buys time until uh, the parties involved agree on how the burden will be distributed, but it does not solve the redistributive struggle that underpins the creation of a common instrument of that kind. And to me, this is also an explanation why the tool was put together in record time. Now, this is not to diminish the importance of the recovery fund, uh, because its financing structure, as Valtra said, initially in a very convincing fashion marks a paradigm shift in EU governance because intergovernmental transfers are substituted with uh, supranational debt. And as such, even if temporary for now, 
the recovery fund signals um, a change in the constellation of preferences and beliefs in, in the Eurozone, I think. So what underpins this agreement? What are these new preferences and beliefs? I have identified two. The first is the recognition that the EU needs a shock absorbing capacity in the face of very large shocks. Even if one has to recognize that the recovery fund is only partially a shock absorber, as I will explain in a minute. And the second is the appreciation, the general appreciation of the role of public investment, which is a win-win in back times because it has short-term effects on output, but it does also expand countries' potential and is thus an important determinant of the extent to which current borrowing can, can be repaid. So in that respect, it is a paradigm shift, albeit not solving this redistributive struggle between losers and winners, which is de facto postponed. Now, the next question, uh, you alluded to, Ariana, is whether this should become permanent. Now, as mentioned, the recovery fund stems to me from the recognition that Euro, uh, the Euro area in particular, needs a shock absorbing capacity when shocks are large. And this is especially desirable if there are fiscal rules in place that limit the stabilization room of individual countries. So if the EU would deactivate the general escape clause and go back to the old rule-based fiscal framework. And to me, unfortunately, this seems like the most likely scenario at present, then the Euro area needs certainly a common budget to respond to shocks that cannot be accommodated via national tools. The problem is, I hinted at this at the beginning, the recovery fund is not a proper stabilization tool because 70% of the funds uh, is allocated to countries with lower than average per capita GDP, meaning it serves a redistributive function more than anything else. 70% of it is redistrib redistributive in nature. So I would make it permanent, but change the current allocation key by taking account of just cyclical conditions in the individual countries. Now, if the EU does not go back to the old fiscal framework and scraps rules altogether, very unlikely scenario, then the case for a common fiscal capacity is obviously, uh, obviously less compelling. So bottom line, with rules in place, almost of all kinds, the euro needs a common budget and the recovery fund should become permanent in the absence of rules, then there's less of a case obviously for a common uh, fiscal capacity. Now, there are positions, political positions out there. Uh, if one looks at electoral platforms, whether in Germany or elsewhere, for which it is exactly with rules in place that put a cap on the maximum stabilization effort that can be achieved at the domestic level, then one needs a common shock absorber. I would stop here unless there's a follow-up question. No, oh, thank you so much, Benedict. I will come back to you with uh, with a follow-up question later. But um, this was a really excellent uh, excellent overview of uh, the tools currently on uh, on the table and what might happen to them. Um, so I would like now to turn to uh, Paul Paul Thompson. So obviously, Paul, you were um, at the IMF in the midst of uh, you know Europe's last crisis and. Uh, you know, based on your on your experiences of, of uh, you know managing some of the bailouts at the time, what are your views on on, on Europe's fiscal rules? Would you agree with some of the uh, you know um, opinions that our speakers have expressed so far that the fiscal rules should be should be changed? And uh, what uh, can and should Europe uh, learn from uh, the experience of uh, of the last crisis? Yeah. Okay. Uh, first, thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I, uh, I, my, I, I see the economic argument for change in, in the rules. I agree that we should probably have a, 
a simple nominal rule with a debt anchor, and debt can be certainly uh, anchored at, at, at uh, in the long term at above sixty percent of GDP. I have no problem with that. I think the economic arguments are more or less trivial. I think there are strong political economy arguments for not making any changes to the to the fiscal rules. Uh, and uh, let me let me explain uh, why I come come to that. Uh, I come from it having sort of been sitting and and being part of. Uh, European policy making uh, uh, in, for many years uh, during the in the run up to the to the COVID crisis, during the whole recovery from the euro area crisis, everybody in Europe and everybody was doing exactly the opposite of what was needed. Right, uh, low debt countries was adjusting uh, too fast, exacerbating uh, internal imbalances. High debt countries uh, 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 stopped reform. Italy and, and Greece even reversed reforms that had been done during the during the Euro area crisis, and uh, uh, the fiscal adjustment uh, 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 stopped, leading to the highly unusual situation that the high debt countries, you know, France, uh, Spain, uh, Italy, uh, leave aside Greece, uh, uh, and with the exception of Portugal, actually entered the euro area crisis with debt at the same highly elevated level at which they had uh, exited the euro crisis. They did nothing to bring down the uh, 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 debt. We were told that that states, uh, well, debt is sustainable, uh, R minus G, et cetera, et cetera. And now we have obviously seen with the bailout, debt was not sustainable. The eurozone would have collapsed without a, a bailout and, 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 and huge north south uh, transfers. I think what is uh, uh, what we are, what we have seen in the run up to, to the crisis is that moral hazard is not just a, a, a concern uh, uh, of, of, of German academics, a preoccupation of German academics. It is real that uh, a number of high debt countries did not undertake any adjustment in the anticipation that were they were uh, bailed out, would be bailed out, which they indeed were. I uh, I understand why the Commission and uh, European policymakers have decided not to try the reforms that were tried last time, pension reforms, labor market reforms, et cetera. I was part of the Troika. I know that the Troika had no political uh, uh, le legitimacy. But the fact remains that without such reforms, North South fragmentation will continue to increase the popular linkage of the pandemic uh, to digitalization, green recovery, it's all good, important issues, has nothing to do with the North-South fragmentation. And that fragmentation is set to increase even further as a result of, of, uh, of, of COVID. That's my, my first sort of uh, conclusion looking, looking forward. I see North-South fragmentation increasing as a result of this. In a, not least because uh, 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 the support is not being linked to the reforms that really uh, matters. I think that is uh, clearly highly unsustainable. And we don't even need to have that discussion because we can see that without transfers, uh, 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 countries like Italy and Greece cannot sustain these uh, debt levels. And again, as far as the fiscal rules are concerned, I, uh, uh, I think this whole discussion of the rules uh, 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 yes, Constantio, Germany might have dictated the rule, but the rest of Europe has decided to ignore that. So uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, I, I think it's a very academic discussion. Uh, uh, and I, if, if I was policymakers in, in countries like Germany and others who are providing the transfers, I would not agree to, to these changes in rules without upfront uh, reforms of pension systems and, and, and other, other structural reforms needed to, to set debt on a on a, on, a, on, a, on a downward uh, uh, tra trajectory. So let me just stop here. Hey, thank you, Paul, for um, this view. I have uh, many follow-up questions that I would like to ask you, which I will get around to next, in the next round. But uh, before uh, we move on, I would like to give the floor to, to our, our last speaker for opening remarks, so Professor Baccaro. Um, so Lucio, I, you know, 
given that you've also you know been studying extensively uh the current politics of the uh, euro's political economy in the current phase um you know to what extent in your view do you see europe's current fiscal framework and the absence of uh, fiscal risk sharing as uh, sustainable uh, both on an economic and on a political level and uh, and what does what would in your view be needed uh, um you know for europe to do in order to address uh, so-called what we could call say the Italy problem. So, you know, countries that uh, face the current uh, conjuncture with uh, very high levels of debt as well as uh, low growth. So okay, um, thanks a lot. Um, let me start by thanking all the participants, um, the other speakers, and uh, uh, let me thank uh, especially, I mean, while uh, Valtraud, Schelkle, uh, um, Benedicta Marginotto and I have opportunities to meet quite frequently, um, once upon a time in person, uh, now online. It's a, a rare opportunity to be discussing with uh, Dr. Constancio and Paul Thompson. So thanks very much for uh, for their um, participation in this uh, in this uh, seminar. So I I will answer your question first synthetically, and then uh, I'll try to elaborate. So in my view, the current fiscal rules are both politically and economically unsustainable. Um, economically, because they, if they were applied in the current form, they would cause a premature retur return to fiscal consolidation and kill the fledgling recovery, provoking, as the experience shows, a further increase in uh, the level of debt as a share of GDP, but uh, more importantly, um, uh, more important are the political re repercussions. If we were to apply the recipes that we just heard from Paul, uh, I would argue that the result would be a popular back backlash against a, a new bout of austerity. I mean, there is really austerity fatigue. And at this point, I would say uh, we risk a crisis, an, another crisis of the Eurozone, but this time a more serious one, even a rupture of, uh, of the Euro. So then the second part of your question is what, uh, what should Europe do uh, to address the Italy problem where Italy stands for a configuration, um, countries that uh, have low growth, high debt, hence their fiscal sustainability is in doubt. I would say that uh, European rules need to focus at this point on the most important condition for fiscal, fiscal uh, sustainability, which is exactly R minus G, where R is the uh, interest rate paid on the stock of debt, uh, and G is the, the growth rate. And in order to achieve that, uh, one needs to keep R low, which is the business of what the European Central Bank is currently doing, uh, more importantly, stimulating G, pulling all possible levers, all stops need to, need to be pulled. Certainly, what we don't need now is to force premature austerity, heavy austerity on countries which have just started the recovery and are not yet back to the pre-pandemic level of GDP per capita. Now, let me, let me articulate better. So at first sight, um, and here I'm going to go back to something that Benedicta mentioned, the long um, term risk. Uh, at first sight, the possibility of a new financial crisis in the Eurozone uh, is far-fetched. I mean, this time it looks as though the actors on the ground have learned the lesson of the early 2010, in particular, the EZB has responded very differently. Uh, the launch of the pandemic emergency purchase program with an envelope, which is uh, sizable. Uh, it was expanded to almost 2 trillion euro while simultaneously continuing uh, the QE, public sector purchase program, relaxing collateral requirement. We had, uh, as part of the response, the suspension uh, of um, the Stability and Growth Pact, uh, the escape, the activation of the escape clause. And recently, we've even had um, uh, European actors overcoming the taboo about common debt and the approval of the uh, next generation EU. I don't uh, put a lot of store, I, um, a lot of hope uh, with regard to the next generation EU, not because I don't appreciate uh, its uh, 
innovative character, but I think its size is massively below what would be needed to face uh, another crisis. Now, so is if the response was different, is everything uh, in order? I would say nothing is in order, not at all. I mean, I like to liken the current situation to that of a house full of gas. Maybe nothing happens, but if somebody mistakenly switches um, um, the, uh, the electric uh, switch, then there's a disaster. As we all know, uh, the government deficit jumped from uh, minus 0.6% in 2019 to minus 72 in 2020. On average, public debt jumped, again, on average, from 86% of GDP to 100%. So what would happen in the situation if the, rule, the current rules of the Stability and Growth Pact were to be, to be applied? Now, let's, let me let me take three countries, France, Spain, and Italy. Uh, the current, as we know, the, the rules look at the structural budget balance, balance which is estimated at around minus 5% by, uh, for 2022. So large structural deficit. Simultaneously, the out output gap for these countries is estimated for 2022 at zero for Spain and France and minus 1.4 for Italy. So we're, we're at uh, potential for Spain and France, slightly below potential, but within the range of normality for Italy. With these estimates of the output gap, what the rules say is that all these countries should, should, should engage in fiscal contraction right now. And because they're all high debt countries, this fiscal contraction should be higher than 0.5% of GDP. In addition, because they are, um, um, their debt is about 60%, there has to be an additional debt reduction effort, which for countries with debt at around 120% of GDP, i.e. France and Spain, amounts to 1.6% of GDP, and it is 2.6% of GDP for Italy, which has 160%. So very, very large fiscal contraction, unless one believes in expansionary austerity, I don't see how this adjustment path is compatible with growth. So growth would be killed. Then perhaps even more importantly, what happens if the ECB decides to return to normality? Now interest rates are low, spreads are low because the ECB is de facto targeting these spreads. These spreads. What if it decides to stop? And now I'm going to focus on, uh, focus on Italy, not because it's a unique case, but it's because it's the weakest link. It's the case where all the problems are most clearly visible. So Italy is a country which has been in economic stagnation for the past 20 years, has had, as we all know, a record number of parties and leaders in an effort to pull itself out of what looks like a never ending crisis. Incidentally, the crisis is overlaps in time where overlap doesn't necessarily mean causation with um, the decision to enter into uh, EMU. Now, uh, for the second time in 10 years, we have a technocratic government uh, backed by a grand coalition, which has the task of turning things around again. 10 years ago, it was Mario Draghi. Uh, sorry, now it's Mario Draghi. Before, um, it was uh, Mario Monti. Now, Italy's fiscal problem, I don't have much time to go into it. It's not at all fiscal profligacy. If you look at the fiscal record of Italy, I mean, at the record of... Um, uh, primary surpluses, it's 2% on average for 30 years. 2% uh, primary surplus for, for 30 years is, is a lot. Um, um, but it's the problem of Italy is lack of growth. Specifically, the interest rates paid on the stock of uh, debt has for the past 30 years been much higher than the growth rate of the economy. And this has led automatically to the ballooning of the debt. Now, with this country, in this situation, the solution is not at all more austerity, let alone more structural reforms. I, I don't understand Paul when he says that there was a reversal of reforms in Italy after the crisis. That's not my recollection. Um, what, what Italy needs urgently is to boost up growth 
while keeping up, keeping down the interest rate. Now, if you do a calculation, if you use the average values of R and G for the past 30 years, then it turns out that in order to just stabilize the debt uh, at 160% of GDP, you need a primary surplus uh, year after year on average of 4.2% of GDP. I agree with Paul that this is uh, unfeasible. And um, the markets may actually start believing that it is unfeasible. They don't now because interest rates are low. The ECB keeps them uh, low. But what if the ECB chooses or is forced to stop its bond purchasing program? For example, by the German Constitutional Court. Now, this could be a trigger after, by which financial markets start questioning the sustainability of the Italian public debt, ask for higher risk premium, and then we have a, a repetition of uh, 2011 uh, uh, up to uh, mid 2012, when spreads with Germany exceeded 500 basis points. Uh, and another trigger would be like a spout with the European Commission about um, the necessity to engage in fiscal consolidation because uh, the stability and growth pact has been reintroduced. Now, what happens in this case? We don't know what happens, but uh, I can tell you based on work that uh, Bjorn, uh, who's one of the organizer, uh, uh, Eric Nymans and I conducted. So basically we asked- Italian Then I will stop you, Lucio, after this. Okay, then uh, I- I'll Basically, uh, what, what this work shows is that for Italians, the perspective of returning to having, of having austerity is um, quite unacceptable. I mean, we have a shift. We, we, we measure a shift of 20% in the favorability uh, um, about uh, remaining in the euro. So rather than having to apply austerity in order to remain in the euro, which would be a condition if Italy were to be in a crisis and were to negotiate uh, uh, a stabilization pa packet with the ESM, they would rather um, go out of the euro. 20% um, just by being informed that austerity is a condition for remaining in the euro, say that what they would rather exit. That's so the, the situation in Italy is rather different from what happened in Greece and Spain during the Euro crisis. There too, we had um, austerity and structural reforms were deeply unpopular. We had um, a, a backlash against established parties, but public opinion ultimately supported the Euro. Here for the first time in the Eurozone, in a large systemic country, we, we have public opinion saying if there is more austerity and saying repeatedly because we did this uh, twice, if there is uh, uh, more austerity, we'd rather get out. Great, so, thank you. Uh, I mean, just, just to conclude, um, situation is calm for the for, for time being, but um, yeah, uh, extreme caution has to be exercised. A return to pre-pandemic normality may be the, tri the trigger that in a house full of gas causes the explosion. Sorry for going overboard. <laughs> that, that's all right. I will we'll get more chances hopefully to expand on some of the politics aspects of uh, your analysis in uh, in the follow-up. So I wanted to now go back to Valtraud for, for a follow-up question. So obviously we have already, you know, a bit of like different positions that have been delineated uh, um, say, you know, more starkly, you know, Paul's idea that, you know, the fiscal rules should really not be changed, otherwise the consequences would be very dire from a political economy angle. Uh, and, uh, you know, um, Lucho's view, which is rather of the opposite side. So if I may ask you, Valtraud, in your opinion, then, you know, where would you stand on this debate? Like, should fiscal rules be reformed or not? And if so, how could, for example, the SGP, the Stability and Growth Pact, be reformed in order to make uh, the Eurozone um, and the Eurozone's economy is more resilient, and what do you see the political likelihood of reform, for example, in the wake of, say, Germany's election results um, from uh, last Sunday? I mean, I would start with saying I think the fiscal, the fiscal rules are the least important discussion we can have and their reform for what happens with recovery and how resilient economies will prove in that. It's much more important the things that, that uh, 
Benedicta has said about shock absorption as we go out and it will be a bumpy ride for some, or what uh, I think Caroline White says in the, uh, in the chat that we may need something like debt rate downs or conversion into equity and so on. What I think is about the stability and growth pact, I mean, it has been reformed from the start, right? Uh, reform after reform after reform, I get actually tired of even observing this, abolish it. What is required in all these member states is an idiosyncratic mixture of measures. Um, and there are no hard and fast, simple rules that you could apply to everybody uh, and to follow them. There's an expenditure rule, yes, but if you look at those who propose it at the moment, um, uh, there was uh, that was from from the from Bruegel. In the end, they come to the fact that in a way you need to come to consensus for five years, perhaps what is to be done and how governments should adjust in their particular situation. Um, it is the responsibility of national parliaments at the moment to ensure sustainable fiscal policy, and no EU intervention can legitimately change that. Now, I think the European semester is a process and provides enough opportunity to have a conversation about unsustainable budgetary policies. And they can issue bespoke recommendations to members because fiscal policy is no longer just a national matter. It has, if you do a massive debt issue, it has externalities because the markets take then what happens in one country uh, as what happens in the usual suspects, right? If a member does not comply with these obligations of membership, namely to do their, their fiscal policy with a view to what it means for the other members, then it must lose political rights of membership, for example, the vote in the council. Now, I, have, I know that this has been proposed and it has been rejected, but I think this must be on the table instead of always this kind of disciplinary uh, recommendations from outside. Last word on Germany, because in a Max Planck uh, discussion, there's always, yes, let's hit Germany over the head. And of course, Vito Costanzo has uh, fed into it. I agree with him that without Germany's cooperation, um, the default position that these fiscal rules are in place will come back. If Scholz or Laschet et al. don't say we should probably uh, reform them because we are way out of the parameter setting close to 60% and 3%. And so we need to rewrite them in any case. If they don't do that, then the default position will be that. But so what? They have never been implemented. If you, Vito Costanzo, say Germany has always uh, ruled what has to happen with, with the stability and growth pact, well, great. Then they don't rule very effectively, right? Because these rules have never been exercised. And so I don't see that as the, the greatest problem. And what I would like as a footnote as well, it was also the ECB that preached const constantly that in return for monetary accommodation, we need harder fiscal rules and fiscal discipline. I wonder whether, so the ECB is a bit complicit in that, that the rules were always played up and then everybody believes that they are actually implemented when they aren't. Um, and I wonder even whether you had ever discussions in the council, because I was in the governing council, whether I was, I was always surprised about this talk by the ECB about fiscal discipline, when the ECB was manifestly not able to keep European economies on a trajectory because the transmission mechanism of its monetary signals was broken. So then to say, and now you do pro-cyclical fiscal consolidation, that would have really been dangerous. And I'm glad, that the member states and the democratic consensus they had resisted it, except where they were forced into it through Troika programs. Thanks. Thank you, Valtraud. So I would like to give Vitor the chance to respond to Valtraud's yep. uh, remarks. About Absolutely. Uh, and also to, uh, if I may, if I have time to uh, pull uh, and even uh, Ucho a little bit. So on uh, these uh, questions, I started by saying that the position of the ECB regarding fiscal policy was not always the same over time. And it is true that during many years, the ECB also took the view that more and more fiscal discipline should be exercised. That has changed with time because 
the overall economic conditions of advanced economies and of Europe have changed and the effectiveness of monetary policy in a regime of very low interest rates has lost effectiveness. And then the ECB started to appeal to fiscal policy also to do its part to push up inflation and normalize inflation in Europe. So it changed over time. Uh, and I can agree, uh, I, I was there inside and I can agree that there was exaggeration also uh, uh, by the ECB in the uh, first uh, period, uh, period. Now, the rules were never implemented, they don't matter. That's not true, absolutely not true. And I talk to you as an insider with deep knowledge of what uh, happened in each country. They were not fully complied with, but I can tell you that without the rules, the laxity of fiscal policies would have been much, much higher than it was. And please look to the huge, if not absurd, uh, fiscal consolidation that was done in Greece, in Ireland, in Portugal during many years. It really was biting. So the rules matter. They, they, don't, uh, they don't matter as you uh, implied or, or were never complied with. That's not the point. By the way, the first country not to comply with them was Germany uh, in the Schroeder's uh, government, uh, as, you, uh, as you know very well. It's actually Portugal, Vitor. Yeah, later. But the first no. one... No, Portugal no. was the very first country no, no, that no, broke no. the stability and growth back. No, okay, fine. <laughs> it's not an important point. To me. It's not an important point, uh, anyhow. But, uh, you know, Germany also. So. The fact that they were not fully complied with, it does not imply at all that they didn't matter. They mattered a lot. And by the way, I would say that what happens to fiscal rules uh, in, in, in Europe will be the crucial factor for the future of the monetary union. Uh, nothing else will be as crucial. So that is uh, my, uh, my view on that. Now to Paul, uh, well, I agree with Paul that more reforms are necessary, yes. And I agree and uh, against uh, what Lucio said that Italy cannot go on as it is with 160% of GDP debt with a deficit that this year will be 11%, that cannot go on. Even if it, Italy goes out, the markets will discipline Italy in a brutal way. And they have to know that. So uh, I agree with all that. But then I have to say that I found really uh, an economist like Paul that I know very well uh, has the astounded position that the 60% rule is forever. When it was devised in a particular period 30 years ago, when the economic functioning of our economies was what it was, and it's no longer that. So it's economically absurd to keep that rule. Economically, also for Germany, by the way, which is in a problem of public investment because of the debt break that Germany imposed on countries in 2009, while before it lived very well with the golden rule, excluding investment from the deficit. And also that cannot, as uh, by the way, uh, Mr. Söder said, that cannot make compatible the green objectives uh, for the economy with the debt break that now Germany has. So this is important and economic absurd to go back exactly as before, even for uh, Germany. Um, and uh, you, know, you have then a list of all uh, re re reputed macroeconomists saying uh, the same as uh, I am saying uh, just now. Um, uh, and there will be, in any case, some degree of fiscal consolidation. Even nothing, even if the pact continues suspended, because of course deficits cannot be as big as they were in 20 and 21. So this means a reduction of the fiscal impulse and a gradual reduction of the debt ratio as a consequence of that degree of fiscal consolidation. The point is, if we go back to the rules, 
then the fiscal consolidation will have to be much bigger. And that's the crucial issue because several countries, and that includes France, not just uh, Italy uh, or Spain or Portugal uh, or whatever, uh, they cannot cope with going back to those rules. And that the political economy problem that is now created. But don't count, and that's my last point to Lucio, don't count that the ECB will continue forever to target, say, the uh, fiscal spreads of each member country. That will not happen. Uh, and it's, uh, by the way, it's not what is happening, but it will not continue forever. It's impossible also, according to the rules, that the ECB will have to respect in the end. Only, the only instrument available is the OMT. If a country enters into a program and then adjusts, and then the ECB will intervene by purchasing uh, its bonds. That's the OMT that was created uh, by us in uh, 2012. That is still there, but it's conditional. It's not unconditional. And uh, so Italy has to consider all these parameters and also the parameter that out of the Euro, it will be brutally disciplined by the markets. Well, thank you. I, I could go on, of course. Uh, yeah, no, we'll have, talking, we'll from, an talking from my experience and uh, what countries actually lived from the inside uh, about all this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Victor. This is uh, really very interesting. Um, so I would uh, like to go back to Paul, perhaps, uh, because obviously there's been some uh, Push back to some of your to some of your remarks, uh, um, you know, both from the other speakers as well as from uh, our audience in the chat. So uh, perhaps you would like to have a chance to respond. It, and if I kind of like, may perhaps formulate a sort of follow up question to you. So um, you know, you have remarked uh, about uh, sort of like the continuing necessity for uh, for structural reforms, and uh, I would like to ask you perhaps to elaborate a little bit more about like what precisely do you mean when you talk about structural structural reforms uh, and how do you see them playing a role in this phase and how does the question of political sustainability also that professor Baccaro was referring to uh you know play into your your assessment right you know under the political right. sustainability of structural or structural reforms and you know if you were to look back at the experiences of, of crisis management last time around would you say that perhaps some mistakes might have been made in how that conditionality was handled last time. So uh, let me first, uh, I just want to reply to Constantia. He, he must have switched off because I explicitly said at the beginning that I have no problem with increasing uh, from 60% and I don't, so, no, so uh, uh, I'm not arguing for going back to the 60% target. Anyhow, uh, uh, I, I uh, 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 and I also want to clarify, I, 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 I think the Troika was a failure. The Troika had no political legitimacy. Uh, and Europe has still established no procedure to give tri Troika type conditionality any legitimacy. Europe has made no progress on being a political union in, 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 uh, in that regard. I understand uh, uh, when uh, my Italian and Spanish uh, colleague says we did not sign up for, uh, for Europe to tell us when to retire. I agree. I agree with that. But neither did the North sign up to provide transfers to the South. And the way it is now, these transfers will have to continue and get bigger and bigger and bigger because there is no mechanism for dealing with the problems. Uh, there is making no pro progress on dealing with the problems. I know some of you might disagree with that. And what do I mean with that? I mean, pension reform is an obvious one. You no, know, Greece, for instance, uh, uh, had an increase in, uh, in, in pension of, of, of some seven, eight percent of GDP in a few years before the crisis and essentially increased the, the pension, uh, the basic pension to close to German levels. It is not, uh, it, so if you're in a currency union and you cannot inflate relative to the center, what do you do? You do pension reforms. There's no way around it. And the same is, uh, uh, you know, pension reforms are, are, are clearly high on the agenda in places like Italy. Uh, and this is one of the reforms that were partially, not fully, but partially reversed after the Monty uh, uh, 
uh, Monty reform. We have seen there was a recent IMF study that it, it is a ma major problem that in all, all the high debt countries, pension reforms are put on the agenda, but always deferred to the future. And when the future comes around, they are diluted or postponed once again. So that's an example of what I, uh, uh, what I, what I argue that given the aging problem without significant pension reform, the fiscal problems we are discussing are gonna get worse and worse and worse in, in the future. So that's just one example of, of the kind of, of particular uh, pension reform. But the government in France, the government in Spain, the governments in Italy are very well aware of these reforms and have attempted these reform time and again, but had to yield to pressure from vested interest. And now we are in a situation where the, the, the result is the need for, 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 uh, for, for, for bailouts, including now to the ECB. Italy, I, uh, I fundamentally disagree that Italy is a victim of European policies. Italy, Italy is a victim of the inability of the clientelistic political system to, to do reforms. Uh, it's a victim of its own political system. And uh, there's no support for reforms for really uh, a matter. And that was not only during the Salvini period, but we have seen reforms being sort of gradually undone uh, for a long period and certainly not made any progress on, on what needs to be done. What I think is, is what really worries me now, and I agree that the pandemic uh, 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 recovery fund is, 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 is actually uh, pretty small and what I looking forward. And what worries me is that uh, the ECB is now being politicized by this policy of deviating from the key. I understand why one did it uh, uh, at, at the time, but I think that uh, there is a real risk that ECB is now being used as a substitute for political, for the European po politicians' inability to have uh, a fiscal union, have political union and, and deal with the problem. The next crisis come around, we will once again need a bailout. And I think what we will see now is that it will be uh, mainly through the ECB. And I think that will create long-term, serious long-term uh, problem. Last comments. We keep on talking about austerity. I am not advocating austerity. Austerity is one of the European myths. There is no austerity. Debt has gone up and up and up. Pr primary balances have gone down as a result of, of, uh, of, of uh, uh, QE. What there is, is there's a lack of reforms. Lack of pension reform, for instance, which means that the young have been paying for this. The IMF did a study recently that shows that the incidence of poverty among the young have gone up dramatically despite the recovery from the euro crisis, while the incident of poverty among pensioners have uh, gone down, fundamentally reflecting that Pension reforms have been successfully resisted. Instead, the, it's falling, the adjustment is falling on education, child allowances, and, and what, what, whatever it is. And similarly, the burden has fallen on capital spending. We have seen that capital spending has been cut three times as much in the high debt countries than in, in the low debt countries. But that is not a reflection of austerity by complying uh, to, to, to EU rules. It's a reflection of the lack of reforms that in countries with relatively limited growth has forced cuts in other spending. Okay, let me stop here. Thank you, Paul. Um, Benedicta, perhaps would you like to, um, you know, come in at this point of the of the debate? First of all, I would like to ask you, just in response to Paul's last point, would you would you agree with the assessment that there has been no um, no austerity, uh, you know, in uh, in Europe in the last uh, in the last decade? But then, I suppose, like looking forward, uh, um, you know. What would you see as uh, the, uh, say, potential options available, say, to countries with high public debt to, you know, continue supporting their economies and uh, move towards a sustainable recovery? Should, for example, debt restructurings or defaults be an option, uh, at the, or what other instruments could there could could be, uh, you know, deployed, uh, looking forward? And also, yeah, what is your view, I suppose, on? The desirability of fiscal discipline going forward given that we've asked everyone pretty much to touch upon this point 
Right, I'm not sure I'll answer in the order of the questions, but <laughs> let me start by saying something about uh, fiscal rules. I do agree that it is a boring debate, but it has to be done. And like uh, Vitor, I believe it is going to be uh, fundamental. Um, I don't like the rules that are in place right now. So I would think that returning to the old regime is a very undesirable uh, scenario. And this, uh, for some of the reasons that were discussed uh, earlier, uh, and that is the fact that the two main quantitative targets, the 3% and 60% are arbitrary. So what is the 3% uh, in practice? Um, it means that the Commission is pre-allocating a certain stabilization room, because the ideal scenario is a balanced budget, you get hit by a downturn and the maximum deterioration of your deficit, deficit should be 3%. So there's a predetermined uh, stabilization room. Now, this was set about 30 years ago. Uh, and we're not sure yet that the type of shocks that will hit European economies will be of the same magnitude. There may be shocks, as we have seen, that cause a much greater deterioration than the 3%. Secondly, whilst I don't like the idea of a predetermined stabilization room, it is also the same for all countries. So this is what I find fundamentally um, um, absurd from an economic point of view that each and every country has a different, uh, has the same sorry, stabilization room. And sometimes there are in the rules um, intervening factors, conditions, clauses that would allow countries to deviate, for example, from the 3% in a cyclical downturn. And what happens is that a larger deviation from the 3% is allowed to countries with low debt. But what discriminates a country with a high and a low debt, the 60%, which is per se arbitrary. So you creating a discrimination amongst countries based on a number that does not have any economic rationale. So I would be in favor of changing the rules. I'm like many out there that believe that the anchor should be that sustainability. I think that should be sustainable first of all. And a country can have a debt of 60% that is fully unsustainable because of underlying structural factors, a rapidly aging population or whatever, and another can have a deficit of 60%, which is perfectly sustainable. So I would be in favor of an anchor being indeed that sustainability. Now, the point is how do high debt countries and low growth countries such as Italy square the circle? Because indeed their debt uh, may well be unsustainable. Um, and here I think that it would be extremely important to make sure that after 2026, which is when the disbursements from the recovery fund come to an end, governments are not tempted to regain fiscal space and they will try to regain fiscal space because no one, no one likes to have a, de a debt which is 160%. They will regain it by cutting public investment again, as they did in the past 20, 30 years. And why public investment is always uh, the victim of fiscal consolidation efforts because it doesn't serve uh, uh, any concentrated group of interests its gains are diffuse. So from a political economy perspective is the first thing you want, to, you want to cut or you are able to cut in terms of the political feasibility. So I would even envisage to avoid this scenario where governments reduce public investment after 2026, I would even envisage a scenario in which the reason rule and I'm not against rules as such, I'm against rules that do not make economic sense, but a rule that forces governments to at least invest to compensate for the depreciation of the capital stock. So you would have not a golden rule that makes public investment SGP neutral, 
that makes it SGP neutral, uh, meaning you go above the 3%, you're not sanctioned. But I would even go even further by imposing um, a, a minimum investment and make this conditional on access to what I believe should be a permanent recovery fund so that EU finance investment through the recovery fund is not substituting domestic investment, but is actually complementary to public investment. So this is one thing, one piece of the architecture that should be in place. Public investment is extremely important and we have to make sure that countries, including and especially, I would say those with a high debt do not stop injecting resources into, into the economy. But of course, there's also the option of restructuring or even I see in the chat debt forgiveness. Now, when it comes to debt forgiveness, we should not forget that through quantitative easing, most of the debt of countries like Italy is with the finance ministers. So the debt is actually held not by the ECB, by the, by the Italian finance ministry and the, uh, sorry, the Bank of Italy, Italy, I'm sorry, by the Bank of Italy. And the Italian ministry is a shareholder, so it's receiving interest payments. And that forgiveness for the way in which the QE has been structured in the EU is far from a risk sharing mechanism at present. I mean, it, it falls directly on the member state that defaults. I'm more open to restructuring with private creditors, vis-a-vis -vis private creditors. That might be an option. Um, but of course, I would reform the governance framework and not have restructuring in, in, you know, in the way in which it appears sometimes in the regulation, because where you see the word restructuring in the current EU governance framework is via the ESM. So there is an application for ESM funds. There's a sustainability analysis. And would the sustainability analysis fail, then the ESM, the authority, says, oh, we can conceive of a, of a restructuring. Now, I wouldn't like a restructuring that takes place because there is, underneath in the background, a fiscal framework that may force governments to run pro-cyclical fiscal policies, have the fiscal problem, and the rules may contribute, maybe not generate the fiscal stress to start with, but just contribute to the fiscal stress. And then you go for assistance, you ask the ESM, and the ESM is suggesting you, su you should restructure. So I would prefer to take the word restructuring out of the ESM and maybe have an EU-wide procedures for restructuring that would govern the relationship between uh, the borrower and private creditors on the other hand. Thank you very much, Benedicta. So very quickly, Lucio, because I would also like to get to some of the questions that were posed in the chat. So um, given that, you know, well, first of all, I guess you would like to probably respond to some of the points that have emerged in the debate um, thus far, but then I would add a further small question. You know, you were referring earlier to the current situation in the Eurozone as a house full of gas. And so what could be done politically by countries that, you know, want to push for a reform to actually achieve this or to, you know, diffuse the situation and get the, the gas out of, out of the house? Is that possible at all? And if so, what are the political pathways that are possible towards, uh, towards change? Yeah, um, so very briefly, because uh, I also want to hear uh, some um, some of the uh, some of the questions uh, from the audience. Uh, there, are, I mean, there are so many things that I could react to that I feel like I, I, I don't know. Perhaps just one um, to uh, Paul. Um, I mean, according to your own organization, which has produced a database of uh, fiscal cons consolidation based on that so-called narrative method, just plot those data and you see who actually did fiscal consolidation. And it's not Germany, um, it's, it's Italy and uh, as, as well as other countries. And I did 
a data collection. I, I, we actually went with a colleague from Bern, uh, Klaus Amangeon. We coded all policy reforms in 11 different fields, whether they were liberalizing or non-liberalizing. Guess who came up on top between 1970, uh, sorry, between 1991 and 2013? It was Italy. I mean, they've done a huge amount of things. Now you can always argue they did the wrong thing. More is needed, okay? Uh, but my, and then my, my, I mean, I don't, I, where is the evidence that these structural reforms actually improve growth? We're all talking about, you know, you need to increase, you know, to, uh, growth increasing reforms. Where's the evidence that that's the case? At least some reforms, labor market reforms were positively counterproductive. What they did was to, to reduce productivity. Part of the reason why we have a productivity crisis everywhere is because the employment intensity of growth was increased because you know we used to have an unemployment problem so the little growth that we had had to produce more uh, more employment results for political reasons and how that was achieved by generating low productivity jobs guess what these low productivity jobs carry low pay for the most part they are precarious jobs so i just so, I mean, I, at the end of, I'm not, I'm the only rationale behind these rational, these structural reforms is to change the nature of these societies. They need to become different types of societies <clears throat> organized on a different basis. And that I personally, I find illegitimate and unacceptable from a Democrat point of view let alone the fact that they're also economically counterproductive. So uh, I don't know. And you asked me a question and I, I, I forget. Oh, so how do you take out the gas? Um, look, and this is uh, a response to what Vitor says, and I agree with him. Until the ECB does what it's, it's doing, there is no problem. There is no financial crisis emerging, okay? The ECB essentially has eliminated the problem with the spread. The question, and we don't even need like transfers, fiscal transfers. That's enough. Okay. The problem is one that went, and the problem is twofold. What the ECB is doing has dubious uh, legal legitimacy. I mean, if you read the treaty, you can interpret it in very different ways, but uh, the, the Master Treaty is fairly, fairly straightforward. When the German voters or German parliament agreed to the Smart Street Treaty and they were strongly against it at the beginning, they could never imagine. I mean, they were promised the, an ECB that would act like the Bundesbank. I don't think they would, they were ready to accept an ECB that does what it is currently does. When the ECB starts, uh, pulls the plug, uh, then I think um, all bets are off. Thank you, Lucho. Okay, so we have quite a few questions that have come in in, uh, in the chat. So we don't have so much time, but we can also go over a bit if our speakers are fine with that. But um, so if you want to ask additional questions, please indicate in the chat. Otherwise, I'm going to start with some that were posed uh, earlier. Um, so I would actually like, given that, you know, it's been touched upon, but not directly, and I think it's a very important point. So Torvald Grung Moe asks in the chat, that you know, returning to the existing fiscal rules is not consistent with the EU new industrial strategy. And uh, why is it not possible, or could it not be possible, to have a fiscal policy support for an ambitious green growth and employment strategy? Um, and uh, uh, you know, I suppose the um, uh, follow-up to that would be, yeah, you know, what what are the the potential what is the potential political possibility of such a, um, of such a, a strategy and uh, um, its economic sustainability so i uh, you know would anyone like of the of our panelists would like to respond to this uh, to this question um, i mean vitor earlier was uh, touching upon the the question of you know structural investments as a as a priority and uh, green transition uh but anyone can jump in but i don't know Victor, would you like to go first you're muted still thank you 
yes, I think that uh, the two things are in incompatible. Uh, if uh, Europe goes to the previous rules fundamentally, uh, with perhaps very, very small change, then the green transition uh, will be uh, uh, in jeopardy. Because it's, it's true, as the liberals say in Germany, that uh, the transition needs a huge amount of private investment. But the question is that private investment of that sort in the present conditions are not commercially profitable enough. They don't offer a rate of return for a private firm decision. And means this means that a lot of public investment will have to be done to crowding private investment and not only public investment, but also straight subsidies that make some of the private investments profitable and that they will happen. Uh, and, and that of course uh, means that fiscal policy cannot be in the straight jacket of the previous rules. The two things are not compatible. Uh, and that's my point. Now, uh, just two very small points, if I may. I forgot to underline one thing that is very important. We talked about the 60%. That is in the treaty. But the Stability and Growth Pact changes the treaty in that because it imposes that the fiscal, fiscal position of countries must be in balance or in surplus over the cycle. And if the position of the budget is zero over every economic cycle, it means that in the long, long term, the debt ratio tends to zero, zero, not 60, zero. That's the SGP, which is totally absurd because the crucial role of public debt as a benchmark in financial markets would disappear. And that's the, S the stability pact that we have. That has to change. Uh, it's not just the 60 thing that also has no economic rationale. Final point. Uh, I think Paul said uh, that uh, you know, nothing will happen because there is no way of disciplining uh, countries that don't do reforms uh, uh, and so on. By the way, I basically agree with Lucio's point that the uh, Europe should not mi micromanage uh, the member countries in all types of uh, reforms. But there are some fundamental macro things that the countries have to take care of themselves but they do have to take care of them. So uh, I agree with that. But there is indeed a final break in all this. And the final break is that in the end, for a country to get support, uh, it has to be assessed by European authorities that it has that sustainability in the long term, in the present conditions, not the 60, in the present conditions. And if it doesn't, then it will have to restructure the debt. Otherwise, it will not get support either by the ESM or by uh, the ECB. So, and that's an ultimate break that countries have to consider because then they would be in their own facing the markets. Paul, well, perhaps maybe you would also like to respond to this uh, question about uh, you know, how to combine the need for large scale investment programs uh, and, you know, for example, support for the energy transition with what you, you know, the, the calls that you made for like the necessity for continuing fiscal responsibility, right? Like, how do you see uh, the potential of squaring the circle between the two? Should the public investment be, you know, exempted from the fiscal rules, for example? I mean, I certainly, you, you asked me, sorry. Okay. Uh, yeah, I uh, I uh, certainly would support a strong fiscal response to support uh, the climate agenda. Uh, no doubt about that. I I agree that one cannot just leave it to the private sector. I think there's significant complementarities, and this will burden uh, fiscal policy uh, 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 significantly. And I have no problem with that. Uh, uh, I think that's called for. But fiscal policy is not a European policy. There is no fiscal union. These are national objectives. And I, uh, uh, if, uh, if, 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 if you say that there should be 
transfers to support countries with limited fiscal space to be sure that they have enough room for maneuver to, to have some good climate policies. I support that too, but that will then have to come with conditions. You cannot expect, no, you cannot expect countries to agree to these open-ended long-term term transfers without, without, a, 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 with, without con conditions uh, to, 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 to show that, that, that at some stage down the road, these transfers will stop. I agree with Lucio that, that the Troika had no legitimacy. I completely, totally agree that, that it, Italy never signed up for having uh, uh, somebody from outside tell them when they uh, uh, should retire. But I also agree, I also, and I, I heard him say also that what the ECB is doing now ultimately also have no legitimacy. And the only way of getting out of this is through reforms. It is through reforms that, you know, of, of, of the reforms that are politically difficult, you know, like the ones I mentioned before, and without it, we are just in open-ended transfers, and there is no political support for this in, you know, in the northern countries. Thank you very much, Paul. So, um... I mean, I would like also to point to all of our speakers that there is also some very lively and interesting debate going on in the chat that I am kind of unable to um, sort of uh, read out loud. Uh, but, you know, for example, the points by Caroline White about, you know, questioning the assumption that growth is uh, is the answer and that perhaps uh, there is uh, a, um, you know, incompatibility actually between some of the environmental goals that we were talking about and uh, the need for um, economic growth. Uh, so. Sorry, could I just make the point on debt? Everybody talks about debt restructuring, right? For, uh, uh, for, for, let, let me just make the point that will never happen, right? It cannot happen. If there is restructuring, the spillovers to other countries will be so dramatic that this, this is not going to happen. I have been in, you know, like Vito, I have been in the room when these decisions have been taken for many, many years. It's not going to happen. It's a pipe dream. You cannot restructure a country like Italy's debt without it having dramatic implication for all high debt countries. It's not gonna happen. Greece, nevertheless. Exactly, it happened with Greece. It is true under present conditions, it would be way too, too dangerous. Yeah, sure. But we need a sovereign debt restructuring mechanism. I mean, on that, Caroline White is absolutely right. The difficulty now is, she mentions Germany, and Germany has indeed benefited massively from a debt write down in the debt restructuring. And this must be the model. The problem is, of course, a lot of the debt that Italy has is towards its own citizens, and that is pensioners. So you have to be ready to say we impoverish our pension population and all those that come the next 20 years. And that is the, very difficult to do under democratic uh, uh, situations. The Greek debt restructuring was a restructuring of the private debt. Most of the debt was transferred into public balance sheets, which was a big mistake. And I have to take responsibility for having been uh, part of this. And that has hopelessly politicized uh, the, the Greek debt problem into a north-south political dimension. And the same is happening now, but the ECB is being used to bail out, right? You start hearing, oh, the ECB should write off, the ECB should do this and that, and we are going to see the same politicization with the way the, uh, that is being handled right now. So I, I very much doubt that you would ha have a public debt restructuring that, that means that taxpayers in some part of, of, of the union will, will, be, uh, will be paying for, for debt restructuring in other parts. In the private debt, possibly. It's not the taxpayers, it's companies, it's, it's creditors, there can be private equity funds. I mean, nobody knows at the moment who holds all the debt uh, and it perhaps is, can be um, spread and dis distributed, but without a sovereign debt, mechanism. I do not see how you can ever get to sensible growth, uh, how you can get out of a situation in which monetary policy can actually not raise interest rates. And that's not because I think, oh, well, there's inflation problem. No, it's the asset inflation and the, that our financial markets have again become these casinos 
uh, chasing yield with financial innovations that the world doesn't need and so on and so forth. That's the problem with the present situation if you don't write down that. The high debt country. Well, that's, that, that's certainly a problem. I, I wanted to make the point that uh, both uh, Lucio and Paul said that what the ECB is doing is perhaps not uh, legally sound. Uh, I dispute that uh, completely. Uh, first, the treaty is clear that the ECB can buy uh, government debt and other securities in the secondary market, not going to the issuance of that debt, and also imposes no limits to uh, what can be the open market operations uh, of the ECB. It's not in the treaty. Uh, and also the deviation that Lucio uh, mentioned uh, in relation to the capital key, it's a transitory thing, as it was said. In the end of these programs of purchases, the ECB portfolio will have to converge to the, the capital key. By the way, the deviations are not over dramatic right now. And the convergence to the capital key can very easily be done in the time of reinvestment of the bonds that get to maturity. In that reinvestment period, which has a, a, a timetable which is uh, for many years, uh, that uh, can allow the convergence to the capital key when the program will be, say, uh, finished. So uh, the deviations are not permanent feature. So what is being done is indeed uh, legal. And I'm sorry, but it was in the treaty. Uh, it is true that in Germany, there was not the uh, open market operations, the buying and selling of government bonds by the Bundesbank. It didn't exist, but existed in several member countries. And when the treaty then was written, it was allowed that the ECB could do open market operations and no limit was included in the treaty. So that's the full uh, situation of, uh, of that issue. But it's also true, what I said before, that the ECB will not continue forever with this uh, policy and this uh, deviation. So it's not forever. Uh, and everyone should be, in the end, aware of that. Only if there is conditionality, because then the OMT can be applied, but it implies also adjustment by the country that would benefit then from that type of uh, bespoken uh, intervention by the ECB. Benedicta, Lucio, would you also like to come in on this uh, on this point? Uh, I mean, many points have been touched, but you know, I guess the the original question was about um, you know the uh, possibilities for uh, debt restructuring and uh, whether that would be politically feasible or or desirable. Or I guess any responses to the point that I've yeah, uh, Benedicta first, then Lucio. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna restate something that uh, I mean I said earlier. Uh, much of the Italian debt is with the Bank of Italy right now. So we should not forget who's who's say how much? 20%. Right. Then there's private debt, uh, and then there's international debt. So any restructuring would fall on foreign taxpayers um, only to some extent. But I do take the point that Paul raised of the contagion, the spillover effects. I mean, I said that this is problematic, but indeed I was referring to the possibility of having some form of uh, restructuring procedure vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, vis -vis private creditors. It is a debate that uh, we should have in any case, like the debate on fiscal rules, because there will be a point where some countries will face a problem. And then it's either some form of restructuring or it is the OMT. Uh, and then we will see what, what the OMT will trigger uh, because as it was stated, uh, there is a conditionality attached to it. So the risk of, of, a, of a popular backlash, um, Lucia alluded to earlier, I mean, is there. And especially in the case of Italy, I think that 
what you find a little in your uh, paper relates specifically to austerity imposed from the outside. I have doubts, in fact, and this is to you know, end my comment on a posit positive note, that let's not call it austerity, but a prudent fiscal behavior may be appreciated by electorates if it is driven from inside, if it is entrenched in the institutions, because I tend to think that after COVID, electorates might surprise us by rewarding politicians that care for debt sustainability and for future generations. What they will go against to me is anything that is imposed from outside. And one last point, Ariana, if I may, there was a question on green growth and employment. I think, unfortunately, we have to talk about these things separately because the recovery and resilience facility is very much about supporting financially the uh, green uh, transition, but there's nothing there as concerns employment. Nobody says that a green uh, transition is going to create jobs. In fact, I would tend to think the opposite. So the EU does not have a strategy to support a job rich recovery. This is what is probably missing in the recovery and resilience facility. And I'm afraid that member states will have to sort this out uh, individually. Thank you so much, Benedicta. Lucio? Yeah, very briefly. First of all, can we can we save uh, the chat so that yes, that is happening. All right. Uh, first of all, um, I just want to say one word uh, to the question whether growth is compatible with uh, the climate challenge. And um, I don't know. Okay, I think it's a very interesting question, and we need to do more research on that. But if I think about it, we have so much to invest. I mean, there is so much space for investment in order to, uh, you know, respond to uh, the environment, the climate change, uh, that I tend to be optimistic. I don't see a trade-off between growth, which is essentially a function of investment, and, uh, and the environment. Actually, I, I believe that uh, if we were to take the uh, climate challenge seriously, we would completely forget about these fake limits on government intervention. I really doubt that we'll be able to, 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 to address this problem just relying on private investment. And I am also suspicious of these private partner, uh, public partnerships where uh, this is the work of Daniela Gabor in particular that comes to mind where the state de-risks and private investors take all the upside uh, I do think that in order to, uh, to effectively challenge the climate um, um, uh, threat, we need massive public investments. And these massive pub public investments are, I mean, if investments do what they usually do, going to um, raise the, the long-term growth rate. So I, I, I tend to be optimistic. I, tend, I think it is possible to reconcile growth and the environment. And the mechanism is uh, higher uh, public investment. Thank you, Lucio. So we're going to have to start moving towards the close. So I would like to give all of our speakers the chance to make some final remarks. And before I do that, perhaps I will can I try to collect and sort of summarize some of the questions that have come up in the chat, which in various ways relate to, I suppose, uh, the sh potential like short term uh, uh, developments that we might see happening, uh, um, you know, in the medium run about uh, the future of uh, next generation EU and more generally about the possibilities for a common budget or a common backstop or a common, you know, shock absorber facility of sorts. Uh, so, um, you know, Laura Silkov asks, uh, how likely do you think that is it that member states governments might back out of the next generation EU in the um, in the coming future? And uh, uh, is it actually possible for member states to absorb uh, all the resources that or more resources than what are already in the next generation EU and the recovery fund, given that there's already difficulties in absorbing funds from the cohesion programs and uh, more generally, a question from Mohammed Ali Nazir, 
who would pay for a common budget or a common uh, backstop of the kind that Benedicta was was advocating, you know, um, wouldn't, for example, the Germans prefer to spend these resources domestically? And I think, you know, we can kind of like sum up all these questions in a sort of like, you know, what what is the likely development in the in the medium run in terms of uh, of risk sharing in the in the EU? And uh, I suppose what what would you see as uh, the likelihood of, of future trajectory of future immediate developments, um, but also feel free to address any other points that you would like to make, um, you know, that you haven't managed to, to touch upon. So I will, I guess, go back to the initial order of the speakers. So Valtraud, if you would like to um, come in and make any last points. I just want to be uh, very brief and I reiterate that I think the fiscal rules are the least important part of the whole thing. I think we are a bit obsessed with them and together with that an obsession with Germany's role, constructive or not constructive. A fiscal issue is there and there is no reason for panic. And I was kind of, I think, like, like Laura Selkopf and others uh, encouraged by that the EU has, at least with this response to the pandemic, tried to break the, the political trajectory that was clearly the, on the divisive and a, we had a politi political legacy that was so acrimonious and I feared had done lasting damage. And by creating this fund, some fences have been mended, but the thing is not over and it will remain contested as you would expect in a union of democracies. And that's quite right that it is. Uh, so will they back out of this NGU? I said earlier, it will depend on how it is used and whether those countries that do not pay for it, that just say, uh, you know, we, we, we back this up and um, we raise the, the tax money for it, giving the commission now uh, tax powers, which have not been assigned fully, but um, they, these countries that have not benefited as much from it because they don't need it, that they will see that this is perhaps a viable thing that is worth having in the future and for a, the long run. That is the hope one can have with this, but it's not a done deal and a lot will depend on how well it is used for investment. Thank you, Valtraud. Um, Victor, would you like to go next? Yeah, on, on these points, I uh, wanted to uh, say that uh, I agree with what Benedicta said about this, that the next gener generation EU uh, program does a lot of redistribution and that's not something that one can see replicated forever. Uh, what the, uh, uh, the EU needs, or uh, basically also the uh, monetary union, is a stabilization fund, which is, uh, well, along the lines of what even the IMF proposed uh, in 2014 or 15, which is then something that can be used when a deeper shock uh, affects the union as a whole, or uh, one or two particular countries in relation to the in uh, development of the rate of unemployment above what it is in the average of the union. And then there is this uh, support. Uh, and the rules uh, are then attuned to that and uh, also guarantee that there is not a mechanism of permanent transfers from a particular group of countries to another particular uh, group of countries. That stabilization uh, fund, if it had been there, would have mitigated a lot the recession of 1213 that the Euro area had. And that's what is needed as a permanent thing. By the way, the ECB has supported this idea from the start. Uh, and uh, I have also uh, wrote about this uh, a lot. And that's something that has to be added to a change of the fiscal rules that the countries uh, will have to uh, comply with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, Benedicta? Yeah, thank you. So I agree with Valtraud, the RRF is not a done deal. As I said at the very beginning, it's unclear who's going to pay. Um, at present, so no policy change scenario and the EU budget and the debt that is generated 
is mostly financed by Germany, which is at present the net uh, contributor, uh, then maybe it has less likelihood of becoming permanent. But would governments agree on increasing own resources, on introducing own resources, there are discussions about uh, plastic tax and whatever, then in, in, in this uh, other scenario, it is more likely that it will turn into something uh, permanent. Uh, obviously, there will be the veto of Central and Eastern European countries if this is transformed into a mere stabilization tool, because now they are receiving a, a large amount of the funds, um, irrespective of their cyclical conditions. So if I see a barrier, a veto player, it would be Central and Eastern uh, European countries more, um, more than anything else. And in terms of the likelihood of a change in the fiscal framework, I'm not very optimistic. I think there's a rule-based culture in Europe that will remain. I give a lot of chance to the possibility of a golden rule, of an explicit golden rule in the stability pact. Because if we just look at the uh, electoral manifestos, for example, of uh, the parties that are most likely to form the new German government, um, there is clearly um, an indication that public investment should be supported, whether via domestic or uh, EU financed instruments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benedicta. Uh, Paul, would you? like to go next. I mean, I'll just sum it up uh, as I, I agree with those uh, saying that the fiscal rules are really a sideshow and that's not the issue. Uh, my observation is fundamentally that we are already very far into a transfer union. Uh, all the Greek debt is on European balance sheets. The Italian debt is quickly being brought on, 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 on uh, ECB balance sheets and uh, 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 we might now in a couple of years have some sort of stability there. When the next crisis hit, there will be another big ratcheting up of these transfer of, 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 uh, of liabilities to European balance sheets. In the absence of reforms, I don't see any support for these reforms. I don't see any, any uh, changes at the political level, political integration that would make sort of Troika type uh, reforms legitimate, uh, but I also fundamentally think that this uh, steady increase in, 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 in transfers that are a result of, of deeper, deeper north-south fragmentation eventually will, will end up in a, a big existential crisis. So I, uh, um, my view is, is a, a fairly somber one. Indeed, but thank you very much, Paul. Um, Lucho? Yeah, I... Um... I actually agree with uh, what Paul just said, uh, and I'd like to emphasize it. So um, in terms of risk sharing, which is the, th the theme of this, um, of this panel, there are two shows, uh, the big show and the, the small show. The small show that everybody talks about is the next generation EU, but it, it's admirable. We don't have time to talk how that emerged, um, uh, but um, it is small. Uh, the big show, uh, which is happening under the table, so to speak, is the the sharing of uh, of the, the sharing of risks through the balance sheet of the European Central Bank. Um, again, if that continues, things can go on. However. Um, precariously uh, they are, they could go on. If that stops, then, you know, then it's a, it, it's a very different uh, uh, scenario. And uh, I'd, I'd like to go back to something that Vitor said. I mean, the ECB is, has a program of bond buying, which is OMT, but it is supposed to be activated after the signing of a memorandum of understanding with uh, the ESM. And I, part of me, again, I'm, I, am, I, I cannot predict the future and, and I don't want to predict the future. Part of me thinks that we are preparing for that scenario. Uh, also with the, the reform of the ESM, which um, 
makes it clear that it has to be uh, an analysis of that sustainability. It was already there, but now it's clear. It's not clear who's going to do that, but we are in a way going. The normalization is, is of that kind. Uh, and that kind of normalization, it is in very many respects a return to uh, 10 years ago to the Euro crisis. And the political repercussions of the Euro crisis have been enormous. And this time they could be even bigger. I mean, I think this time, if it goes that path, uh, the Euro could be at risk. But uh, I don't even know if I have to be, if I have to hope that's that, that's not the case. I'm just this is just what I what I see. Indeed, I guess uh, the question of uh, you know assessment of that scenario is, uh, mm -hmm. is you know a deeply political question after all. Um, so I would like I think you know due to time constraints, I mean we could keep going on, but we really have to draw to a close now. So I would like to take this occasion to thank again really very warmly our speakers for this lively debate and for the uh, generous and stimulating intellectual engagement with, uh, with the debate. I think this has been really, really interesting and thought provoking. And I think we will go back to reread the chat and, you know, think back on some of the some of the points that have been raised. I would also like to extend the thanks to Frank van Lerven from the New Economics Foundation and to Leon van Sleben and Donato Di Carlo from the NPIFG for helping to organize and put together this event. Um, the New Economics Foundation's Fiscal Matters Week of Debates continues uh, tomorrow and Thursday with uh, various uh, uh, online panels on uh, uh, the future of fiscal rules in the Eurozone. So please uh, uh, check them out. There is a, um, a link that Bjorn has posted in the chat and uh, sign up on Eventbrite. And uh, our own seminar series of uh, Seminars in uh, Comparative Political Economy continues with a normal program on October 20th, and you can also check the program on the MPIFG website that Bjorn has also posted in the chat. Uh, so I would like to you know, really thank you all again in the audience for sticking around uh, way past our uh, official ending time. And uh, yeah, have a good evening, everyone, and see you next time. And thank, thank you again you. so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for your excellent thank you. moderation. Thank you, all. Thank you, all. Thank you everybody. Bye. 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 Great, uh, Bye. Thank great you. Uh, debate. Thank you. Yeah. Let's Bye. keep in touch. <laughs>